ETA's decision to disarm in Spain. They fought for decades to create a Basque homeland. Now, they could be ready to hand over weapons to the Spanish government. Is it the end of their separatist fight? This is Inside Story. Hello and welcome to the program. I'm Darin Abugeida. The Basque separatist group ETA is said to be ready to disarm early next month. The arrest of many of its leaders and weapon seizures has weakened the organization. The decision to lay down its weapons by April the 8th could lead to ETA being dissolved altogether. While well, hundreds of people have been killed during the decades-long fight for an independent Basque state, car bomb explosions and shootings targeted police, politicians and businessmen. But as the police fought back and squeezed ETA's operations, the group has been forced to give up its campaign. It also lost public support. Six years ago, ETA's leaders declared they would cease their armed struggle but didn't surrender their weapons at the time. And now Spain's prime minister says the latest disarmament announcement should be unilateral. My position and that of the government and that of the People's Party is exactly the same as it has always been. ETA says it's decided to disarm itself unilaterally. It should do so and it should dissolve itself too. What the Spanish government will do is what it has always done, apply the law equally to everyone. Well, the separatist group has been fighting for decades in pursuit of a Basque homeland. ETA, which in the Basque language means Basque country and freedom, was founded in 1959 during the dictatorship of General Francisco Franco. The armed group has killed 829 people in a bomb and shooting campaign to carve out a homeland in the north of Spain as well as south of France. ETA renounced violence in 2011, but it didn't hand over its arsenal of weapons. Let's now bring in our guests joining us in Dublin via Skype. We have Paddy Woodworth. He's a journalist and expert on Spanish and Basque issues in London. Ramon Pacheco Pardo. He's a Spanish and is a, he's Spanish and is a senior lecturer at King's College. And in Biarritz in southern France, also via Skype, Christian Herbolzheimer. He's a director at Conciliation Resources. That's an organization that serves as a resource for organizations pursuing peace building and conflict resolution initiatives. Welcome all of you to Inside Story. But before I speak to the three gentlemen, we'll cross over to Urko Ayartza. He's a former senator of the pro-independent Basque coalition, Bildu. He's currently involved in the peace process, joining us via Skype from San Sebastián. Thanks for speaking to Al Jazeera. So why after decades of confrontation, often violent confrontation and conflict, are we now getting reports that ETA uh, will fully disarm by April the 8th? Well, first of all, uh, as you know, as you have said, ETA decided to declare the end of the army campaign in 2011. This decision was taken after a long process of divide internally promoted by the Basque political forces in the Basque country are basically the Basque political force that has been considered the political wing of ETA. At that time, the people that promoted this, this debate internally for a new strategy of peaceful and democratic wins, ways to find our, our goals of self-determination, as you know, they were arrested and put in prison by the Spanish government. But still, and nevertheless, this debate produced the end or the last decision of ETA to declare the end of the armed campaign. Of course, since then, ETA has tried to find ways to disarm themselves. The point is that the Spanish government has, during all these five years, tried to avoid and tried to stop this process of disarmament. As you know, any process Why of disarmament... Why do you say that the government has tried to stop this process? Well, the, the Spanish government has tried always to, to, to show this, uh, this process as a, as a process of winners and losers. The point is, or the weak point is, that ETA declared themselves to end the armed campaign unilaterally, not because of the pressure of the Spanish government, that it was there, but because there was a decision of the basically the political forces that they were supporting or understanding the struggle of ETA, they were asking them or demanding them that it was time to end the armed campaign. Here's so the thing, the, though. ETA always linked its disarmament to allowing its jailed members to serve sentences uh, closer uh, to the Basque region, closer to home. Has ETA now dropped this concession? 
Well, what ETA has declared was that there were several consequences of the conflict. That was the issue of the weaponry, and that was the, there was the issue of the prisoners, and of course there, there is the issue of the reconciliation. And ETA has demanded is that all those issues should be resolved. There was no demand of quick pro quo. There was no demand of quick pro quo solution to, to those issues. And ETA has declared during the last couple of three years that he was ready to disarm. We must remember that in, there was a former, there was formed an international commission for the verification of the ceasefire, who started a process of putting arms beyond operational use, with relevant people like Ronnie Kazil, the former minister of, of intelligence of South African Ar South Africa, or the chief staff of the Indian Army Satis Nambiar, and those members were prosecuted by the Spanish government because trying to promote this process. But what does so this what all mean for for ETA as an organization? It, does this mean that it's going to be fully dissolved? Well, it seems that the first decision is just to put arms on operational use, then to disarm themselves. And of course, uh, what what it has been said that ETA probably in the last in the next step will will start thinking on how which is about their future and if they have to to get out of the stage or not. Naturally, all the majority of the vast society consider that once ETA has disarmed itself and that, that this is over, the best for the Basque country is that this process continue and they have decide themselves what to do for the future. All right, uh, Orku Ayrza, thank you very much for speaking to us uh, from the north of Spain. We appreciate your time with us. Let's now uh, cross back to all of my guests, Dub Dublin, London, as well as Biarritz in France. Uh, Christian, let me ask you about your take on this uh, reported disarmament. And you were at a disarmament forum in Biarritz where you speak to us from. Can you shed light on what was discussed there and uh, perhaps what the process of disarmament is going to be? This is a quite unique peace process. Um, it's uh, unique in the sense that it's not the result of a negotiations, political negotiations between ETA and the Spanish and the French states. Um, Spain has for the last years rejected any kind of negotiation with ETA and that has therefore moved ETA to take steps unilaterally. But of course the political debate is still very vivid and as we've heard before, the, there is the, from the Spanish state an effort to clearly um, 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 come out as a victor and having defeated um, ETA uh, um, um, and at the same time ETA trying to find an honorary way out of this situation not appearing to be defeated and that's what has made this uh, disarmament so complex after ETA already announced six years ago that they ceased their um, armed activity. Um, what has happened then is that um, interestingly um, there's a quite a big consensus in Basque society that there's three kinds of actors that need to be involved in addressing disarmament, but also the other issues of prisoners, victims, and reconciliation. And that is the Basque institutions on one hand, the Basque political parties, and civil society. Now, in a unique process like this one, a unilateral peace process, you also need unique solutions. There is no experience in the world of civil society participation in disarmament. And the forum here in Biarritz has been looking into options of how can civil society play a role in this disarmament process, which is a fundamental but insufficient step um, in the peace process in the Basque country. Uh, Ramon from London, you're a Spanish citizen, but how do you, as a Spaniard, assess ETA's move towards disarmament? Well, having grown up in Spain and uh, having seen uh, terrorism uh, when I was growing up, I think in Spain there is a sense of, of relief. Uh, there is this idea that finally the uh, uh, terrorist uh, group uh, is going to announce soon probably that it is going to dissolve because once it has disarmed, uh, basically has no uh, reason to uh, continue its operations. And I think for the most part, it has been greeted uh, in Spain with a mixture of uh, joy. People are joyful that actually ETA finally has decided to disarm and will probably dissolve uh, sometime soon. But also a, a, bit of, a little bit of sadness because the situation in the Basque country for a very long uh, time, for, for four decades actually, uh, has been quite violent. And this violence has led uh, nowhere. And since it has led nowhere, it seems that uh, the existence of ETA to one extent has been detrimental to the Basque country, to the rest of Spain, and hasn't achieved anything. Uh, Patty from uh, Dublin, to just take you back to 2014 for a moment, because at the time, ETA had taken some of its weapons uh, out of action. Spain saying this is a theatrical move, this is just symbolic. Are we at the same situation today? Well, I don't think we know yet until we see what happens on April the 8th. 
Um, what happened in 2014, yes, was a little theatrical, but it was also symbolic. And I think the response of the Spanish government and the Spanish judiciary was not helpful. And I think it's interesting if you look at the comments made by Jonathan Powell, Tony Blair's former chief of staff, who also participated in the Irish peace process, he pointed out that an armed organization actually needs some assistance in order to disarm. So even if the first gesture in 2014 was inadequate, uh, it does seem an extraordinary and negative move by the Spanish authorities to actually move towards, I don't think they actually did prosecute the distinguished international figures who were attempting to assist this process, as similar figures had in Ireland, uh, but they did actually call them before the courts and threaten them with prosecution. So this is a rather extraordinary situation where people are trying to disarm a group or help in the disarming of a group and they're accused of collaboration with terrorism. I, I think we need to look at a lot of context here. I mean, I, with respect to Christian, I don't think that the problem is only that the Spanish government hasn't participated in this peace process and hasn't negotiated now. The context for that, unfortunately, is that ETA in 1998, 99 and 2006 in two other peace processes, in my view at any rate, did not understand the nature of negotiation. And I think to use the Irish parallel, and actually to use it to make a distinction, uh, what was striking about the Irish peace process, and which many of us had not expected, is that the IRA did negotiate, by which I mean it changed some of its own core principles and demands to accommodate to settlement. Whereas in 98, 99 and 2006, ETA often during negotiations forced its political wing to actually harden its demands. So I, I, I think this is like all conflict. It's a situation where there are, are faults on all sides, uh, like Ramon uh, and having covered this conflict over more than nearly 40 years now. Um, I have to say, I regard this with, with happiness, I, I, I think. But how um, do you think, Patty, that the Spanish government is going to react? Because what we know so far, up until this point, uh, the government spokesman has only said that ETA has to do two things, disarm and dissolve itself. Are, are they going to accept these weapons that ETA is going to uh, put forward? Well, there's an interesting, again, I say, until April the 8th, is over, we won't know what form this disarmament is going to take. But from what I've been reading about it, and only reading, as I'm obviously in Dublin at the moment, um, it, it appears that what is involved is actually a kind of note. This is what I'm picking up a notification to the French government as to where their arms dumps are. You need to remember that most of ETA's arms dumps have traditionally been. On the, in the French Basque country, or deeper, if you like, into France. Uh, so that, that is probably where most of their arms still are. Uh, so the Spanish government may not, in fact, be directly involved. Um, and, you know, I, I don't know how the French government will respond. I, I do believe that in the, what, what I think Urco described correctly as a unilateral and most unusual type of peace process, I do feel that the Spanish government, which is a a uh, hard right conservative government, um, uh, which, to be quite honest, and this is, I know is a very serious thing to say, uh, it has appeared that there are times when the continued existence of ETA actually suits the ideology of the, of the conservative government in Madrid. Senior conservatives have on occasion said off the record that uh, their nightmare, in a sense, is a Basque country without ETA, but which still demands independence. Because as long as you can label your opponents demanding independence as terrorists, well then they're not going to get any support within the European community, etc., etc. Right. But if there is a peaceful movement for independence, as there is in Catalonia at the moment, then this poses a much bigger problem for Madrid. So we're looking at a very complex jigsaw here. Ramon, can you weigh in on that, on that issue of independence, and what impact does this disarmament, should it actually happen on April the 8th, have on the issue and the struggle for uh, self-independence, self-determination? Well, what we see in the Basque country is that support for independence has been uh, declining over the past uh, five to ten years. It has never been a majority movement in the Basque country, and I think this is one of the reasons 
uh, why ETA failed. Uh, most Basque people wanted not to become independent, to remain uh, with the rest of Spain. So in a sense, they didn't have the social support that our independence movements might have had in, in, in other countries and have allowed them to become successful, let's say Kosovo, uh, for example. So there's one aspect there that I don't think independence is going to pick up. But as Paddy was saying, and I agree with him, I think it is going to become uh, more difficult for the central government in Madrid uh, to argue that uh, independence moves in the Basque country are linked to violence, because that's not going to be uh, the case anymore. So probably it's going to change the uh, political situation in Madrid uh, and probably also in the Basque country. Uh, with regards to other independence movements uh, in Spain, since they have been peaceful, to be honest, I don't think they're going to be affected uh, by this move. If you look at Catalonia, for example, Catalan independence movement has made very clear that it has nothing to do with violence, that it has nothing to do with, uh, with ETA, that it has nothing to do uh, with terrorism. So in a sense, uh, ETA was not only isolated uh, within the Basque country, but also the independence movements didn't really have sympathy for the tools that ETA was using to try to achieve his goal. Now, Christian, your point of view, does this invigorate or not other independence movements? No, I don't think it will have any influence. Um, I myself, I am, a, I am a Catalan. The process in Catalonia, as has been said, is completely different. But from a peace building perspective, I want to highlight the uniqueness of this process. This is not the only case where a state has an internal armed conflict uh, and violence and rejects negotiating with an armed group. That's quite common to other contexts in the world. But it is quite unique that there is being progress despite this stubborn rejection of, of, of engagement. And in that sense, uh, because it's so context specific, the fact that the civil society in the northern Basque country will play a major role uh, in making this disarmament happen, if it now happens by April 8th as expected, that will be huge, that will be creative, that will be innovative, and that will be an interesting references for these processes elsewhere. So, um, uh, Patty, does this gesture now signal a, a real peace process? Well, you see, peace process does have to, at some stage, involve something from the other side. But, you know, to be clear, in my view, um, I don't think it's useful to use emotional words like defeated at the moment. I think ETA's project has failed. I think it is as simple as that. I think Ramon is right. Um, ETA has never had majority support in the Basque country, though I would, I would, I would suggest that we don't actually know because there has never been a self-determination referendum in the Basque country. Uh, we don't really know. We only know from opinion polls what support for independence is. It certainly fluctuates. What I find very interesting and where I think this is a, a process, a, a peaceful process, which is changing Basque politics, um, I actually suspect that if, if Madrid granted the right of self-determination to the Basque country, I think actually most Basques would vote for possibly a new federal association with Spain. I don't think there would be a majority for independence, but I simply don't know. Uh, what I do find interesting is that ETA, when I say its project has failed, its military, its armed project clearly failed and it became weaker and weaker and weaker since the late 1990s onwards, but its political project was failing because of its armed project. In other words, um, people, fewer and fewer Basques were voting for, if you like, ETA's political wing, Batasuna, which at one stage in the 90s was able to garner up to 18% of the vote in the Basque autonomous community. By 2007, that vote was dropping to 6 7%. But what's really interesting is that since ETA's ceasefire in 2011, the vote for pro-independence parties, explicitly pro-independence parties, has risen to as high as 25%. So in a very odd way, you know, the, the independence movement now, without the millstone of terrorist violence around its neck, is actually advancing faster. But as I say, like Ramon, uh, I simply don't know what the outcome uh, may be. None of us, none of us can, can see the future. Uh, Ramon, should that... Uh ring true with you uh, that the pro-independence uh, movements are advancing, then surely this is going to worry uh, the Spanish government. 
It is going to worry the Spanish uh, government, as you say. Uh, having said that, Spanish, Spanish politics are very complex, as they are in any other country. So to an extent, uh, right-wing parties in Spain, uh, I, I would say at the national level, they actually do benefit if they are pro-independence movements, because they get a share of the vote of people who don't want Spain to break up. Uh, so they can see the potential benefits of uh, running against the uh, pro-independence movements, uh, maybe in, in, in the Basque Country, in, in Galicia, in, in Catalonia, different regions uh, in, in Spain. So I think the Spanish government is worried, the current Spanish government, but I don't think the Spanish government would be too concerned if independence votes, uh, the pro-independence parties in the Basque Country continue to get 25, even go up to 30% of the vote, because this is not a majority of the Basque population, but it is enough people for the Spanish government, to, for the right-wing party to actually say, look, if you don't vote for us, maybe if you vote for the left-wing parties in Spain, in Spain, they will be more willing to actually, for example, consider pro-independence referendum. And, the right-wing party in Spain, the popular party that is currently in power has been traditionally has always been opposed to this and it can present itself as the guarantor of the unity of the country, of the unity of Spain. And, and, and just one more question to you, how crucial then will be what happens in September in Catalonia? Because uh, there are reports that Catal Catalonia will uh, or might be rather holding a referendum on its independence in September of this year. Well, I think uh, so much has been predicted and discussed about Catalonia that I wouldn't want to, to, to say anything because we don't know what will happen. I think there's going to be a negotiation process definitely over the next uh, few months. In, in fact, there have been contacts uh, behind closed doors between the central government uh, and the government in, in Catalonia. And I think the referendum probably uh, won't be held, uh, at the very least, if there is a vote is uh, not going to be uh, legal, it's not going to be authorized by the central government uh, in Spain. So I think from now until then there will be this negotiation process and they will see what happens, maybe reach a, a settlement uh, that means uh, more devolution uh, for Catalonia or if the Catalan government is not happy uh, with what happens, they try to have the referendum but because this is not going to be legal then it's really not going to change much from the vote that took place a couple of years ago. So in a sense, even though we don't know, I don't think the situation is going to change dramatically from now to September. I think a bigger change might take place after we have the next uh, regional elections in Catalonia and depending on the composition of the regional parliament, we'll have to see what type of negotiation process the central government has to establish with the regional government. Because I think everyone uh, in Spain, even the current government agrees that at some point the two sides have to sit down on the table right. and see what type of agreement uh, they can reach. Uh, Christian, you, sp you spoke to us about the impact and the role of civic society when it comes to this disarmament. But, uh, you know, l don't want to jump the gun here. We'll obviously have to wait and see what happens on April the 8th. But how does the region uh, come to terms with its history and what is the role of civil society in doing that? Well, a couple of comments. First one, um, ETA is not handing over the weapons to the Spanish government, as was suggested at the initial, at the beginning of this program. And that is symbolically very important. ETA is laying down its weapon in, with the accompaniment of civil society. So symbolically, they are not surrendering. And, um, and that for them is then very important. Now, there is still a deep um, consequences of violence in Basque society. The wounds are still deep, they haven't healed. There is still a need for a major actions of dialogue and reconciliation. For acknowledging of um, harm done and committed, even asking for pardon. And the issue of victims needs to be brought back at the center of the talks, like it has been happening in Colombia recently, but without the politicization of the past. This issue has been very polar polarized in Spain and in the Basque, in the Basque country. There have been um, crimes committed by ETA. There has also been crimes committed by the state, which the state has never, never acknowledged. So there has to be some sort of coming together of truth telling, of getting the full story out, and that what has been defeated eventually is, of course, ETA's um, armed project, right. but violence in general, whether it comes from ETA, from state forces, or from other paramilitary groups.
All right. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, we'll have to leave it there. We'll certainly be keeping an eye out on that story. Uh, Patty Woodworth, Ramon Pacheco Pardo, and Christian Herbelzheimer, thank you for joining us on Inside Story, and thank you for watching. You can see this program again anytime by visiting our website, aljazeera.com. For further discussion, go to our Facebook page. That's facebook.com forward slash AJ Inside Story. Join the conversation on Twitter. Our handle is at AJ Inside Story. From myself and the whole team here in Doha, goodbye for now.